Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. And thank you so much for being so generous with your time. I did put an apology, not because of anything important I was doing. Today is the 80th birthday of Adelaide Tambo, <coughs> but also 101 birthday of Holisha Nelson Mandela. So 10 years ago, the United Nations decided to call this officially a Mandela Day worldwide. And the ask is very simple. Can you find 67 minutes in your busy schedule just to do random acts of kindness? So this morning I woke up. I didn't do anything important. I went to the Nelson Mandela Children's Hospital just to go and read stories uh, to those kids. And I thought it's better work than putting on an overall and shovel. So I'm dressed for, for that occasion. The plan was to be here at 13.30. I hope I didn't keep you too long. This young man says he knew me when I was chairman of Shell. This is where the folly of youth becomes useful. I knew him much, much earlier than that when he was still a stone thrower, because we threw some stones together. <laughs> At that time, we could throw a stone so accurate through the windscreen of a Coca-Cola truck would have played cricket. <laughs> so what I wanted to do this afternoon is to be slightly insistent and persuas persuasive but also to be slightly provocative because I was told this is going to be really a conversation. So allow me to just paint a broad perspective, a spectrum, a potpourri that would allow us to interrogate our space at this time in this country when so many of us dare to hope that joy and peace will prevail. Volume is still okay so far? Is there anybody who can hear me? You can hear me well. <clears throat> Liberal democracy is premised on four pillars. The first pillar is constitutional democracy. The second is the free press. The third is the rule of law. The last is the one that turns me absolutely on. It talks about an independent but an engaged civil society. We say we've got the best constitution in the world. Not because we are clever, but because we stole unashamedly. When you come late, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So we stole from the Canadian experience as to how we empower women. We stole from the Malaysian experience, the Bumiputra who excluded from the economic mainstream when the indigenous people like us were in the kitchen barefoot and pregnant. The economy dominated by people of Indian extraction and indeed Indian orientation. They wrote under Mahadir, Vision 2020, knowing that his term of office is much shorter than the vision he was setting for himself and thereby setting a foundation for governments, countries and entities to start thinking long term about this notion of brotherhood. We infused this and we have clearly, and I say so with all seriousness, but also with humility, the best constitution in the world. If we even forgot about section 195, that talks about the executive duties of our parliamentarians, their job descriptions as to what is required of them. That's too detailed and too complex. But look at just the one pager, which is the preamble to our constitution, as a backdrop for having today's conversation. And let me selectively 
remind you of just what that one page says. So it starts with the words, we the people, not the politicians. United in our diversity. Look at that gift. It recognizes that we are male and female, young and old, black and white. And then it doesn't promise, but it guarantees the three freedoms. Four actions we are emboldened to act to effect this. But let me just talk about the three guarantees that it makes. Freedom of association. So you can kiss somebody of the same gender. You are not going to go to jail like in other parts of the world. Freedom of speech. You can say the immediate past president is a thief and sleep in your own house and wake up in the same bed without anything having happened to you. Some of us who are activists know that it wasn't always the case. But here's the last freedom that it guarantees. It says freedom from hunger. So forget that everywhere else in the world, including the biggest economy in the world, US of A, if you are black and poor, you are likely to be locked up in jail than if you are white and wealthy. But in South Africa, 25 years into democracy, all of us have not collectively succeeded in eradicating the legacy of apartheid. Not just about apartheid special planning. That has ensured that 25 years into democracy, a majority of black people spend 40% of their time traveling from where they sleep to where they work. 40% of their pay just on transport. Because they happen to live on average 40 kilometers away from where they sleep to where they work. 25 years. It's a long time. Because in 20 years, Germany woke up one day and said, we are not fulfilled, we are not whole. We cannot be internationally competitive. For as long as there is East and West Germany, it was the West Germans who said, we want a united but nonetheless prosperous Germany. And they did everything in their power. And in 20 years, there's one Germany that by and large is prosperous. They invested in East Germany. They stopped investing in West Germany because it was okay. It was wealthy, it was exposed, it was wealthy in East Germany. Today, one united prosperous Germany. It's what they achieved. 20 years. So we're not talking about generations here. 20 years. So on the 27th of April 1994, when we were emboldened in the snaking queues, voting for the first time for our democratically elected president for the first time in 350 years. Rwanda was going through the worst genocide. So in 90 days, 800,000 people died. But in 20 years, out of the seven fastest growing economies in the world, seven of them are in Africa, one of them is Rwanda, from a low base. But today in Rwanda, when you get into their buses, you get free Wi-Fi. 25 years into democracy, what do we have to show? We talk about the nine wasted years. Because in leadership, like in management, we have learned to focus. Because if you try and boil the ocean and save the world, sometimes you achieve nothing. But if you focus, it is possible, even if there are 10 things to be done, to do just the four that are impactful, that can move us forward in space and in time as a people with great natural endowments. 
So let me focus on just the opportunity cost of the last 25 years because of the choices we have made. And upfront to say we are poor not because South Africa does not have enough resources. Because if you divide 1.4 trillion rands that we collect from the South African Revenue Services on average a year every year by 58 million, there's 57.8 million of us, there is absolutely no reason why anybody should go to bed hungry. There isn't. Nine wasted years. Not the whole 25 years. Even though the original sin was Sarafina. Even though the first industrial scale looting, when we're not at war with anybody, Kholisa Nelson Mandela was our president, we walked tall and proud, and the South African passport for the first time was worthy of something. We chose the arms deal. Former President Tabumbeki, up until today, refuses to use that term, uses st strategic procurement of arms. <laughs> 50 billion. So to be illustrative, because I said, I just want to focus on the nine wasted years. So in four years, we have lost by the back of the cigarette box calculation that we did as business leadership South Africa. I can tell you it was much more detailed than that. 1.5 trillion South African rent. In four years, not in nine, four. How many Michael Komapis and Lumkam Ketwa, five and a half year olds, would be walking amongst us with shrieks of laughter versus the sad, tragic, and regrettable death of suffocating in a pit latrine toilet 25 years into democracy? how many we could have eliminated with 1.5, just in four years. In the last nine years, on average, we have been siphoning off, not to the 88 of our leaders that were out at Inubusa, not the 33 in VBS. But just to two Zupta families. 100 billion a year every year for the last nine years. 100 billion. So the piece of work that we did when we were talking about fee-free higher education, of all the 1.2 million students in institutions of higher learning, not just the indigent or the missing middle, where the threshold was 359,000, we upped it to 600,000. All of them. That was 53 billion for everybody. 53 billion. A year every year we've been giving just to two families. Nobody asks, how come just at Transnet when we had an opportunity to buy the largest order of locomotives in the world? 1,064 locomotives. 1,064. I exclude Lucky Montana's Brasa. Just Transnet. Because at Prasa, they gave all the money to Shivam. They ate it, and they woke up one day and said, oops, they are going to ask us where are the trains. And they said to the Spaniards, give us something. And they gave us those locomotives that were just too tall for infrastructure. As an afterthought, the impunity, the scale, it's mind-boggling. So nobody asks that the business case was taken to the transnet board to say, with foreign exchange considered the time value of money as to when these things are going to be delivered. This was 30 billion. At the time of paying, there was 16 billion more. Nobody asked, but how did this happen? 16 billion. You can build an entire town <laughs> with 16 billion, with no pit latrine toilets. And when asked later on, Brian Mulife, with Anoch Singh, whilst they were still a transnet, before they were promoted, because they did such a good 
stealing job to say, let's do the same at ESCOM. And he says, no, no, no. It was foreign. He forgot in his own business case to say with the 30 billion, it's all inclusive. And as a people, we did not doi doi. And we wonder why we are where we are today. It was General George Patton who said, great wars are won by good execution, not by great plans. Because good execution will save even a mediocre plan. If there was an Olympic sport for developing plans, South Africa would win hands down. Because we've got a plan coming out of every orifice. <laughs> My best was the reconstruction development plan. Today when you ask millennials what's an RDP, they think it's a house. <laughs> we even had a ministry of RDP, J. Knight, whose job to do that? You know the RDP was the best plan for me, not because it was perfect or comprehensive, but because government signed off on it, business signed off on it, and labor signed off on it. And it laid the foundation for this entity that we refer to as NEDLEC, where we said we need to talk about the type of South Africa we dream of and we pray for to give effect to the South Africa of Holy Sasha Nelson Mandela's dreams. the choice of leaders we make. It's what has plunged us into this port of border where we now have a fiscal crisis. So Madame Elasel Ramaphosa gifted to us on the 19th of December 2017, not as our second chance, but as our last chance. Because if we mess it up this time, we'll be just another failed African country. Last chance. Can you close your eyes for a second and imagine what could it have been like if NDZ-17 had won? The consequences are too ghastly to contemplate. That's why it behooves every single solitary one of us to make this democracy work. It must work. Because otherwise our children will disown us. That's why we must own it at a personal level. Because we said in that constitution, we the people. And the last part of that preamble, it behooves you and I, it enjoins us to address these inequalities. Not the politicians, you and I. So the acts of random kindness that we do today are symbolic, emblematic of what we as a people with great natural endowments can do when we put our thought processes, our hearts, but also our shoulders to the wheel with the singularity of purpose. One country, one people, one South Africa, one flag, one national anthem. So in all of that, I won't even ask you what then should be the role of you and I but maybe the role of business because I represent big business. BLSA has 88 <laughs> CEOs of large companies, most of them listed on the JSC. 53 of them are responsible for more than half the GDP of this country. They employ 13 and a half million people. Government in all three tiers, 1.3 million people. If you even use the extended definition, 2.3 million people. So I'll end on just that piece. What can we do then as business? So that as I s sit down and we have some violent disagreement, maybe a question or two, <laughs> then we can talk a little bit about what we can do as, as individuals. But before I do that, again, if you do a back of the cigarette box calculation, now you calculate not the actual loss but just the opportunity cost for us. You then say, Holy Sasha Nelson Mandela inherited a technically bankrupt country. In five years, he quadrupled the size of the GDP. Because at that time, we're adding half a million families, black families into the middle class. 
half a million students in institutions of higher learning, we increased to 1.2 million. He handed over to Tabombeg in what is truly a world-class, seamless handover of power. Tabombeki gave us 43 consecutive quarters of positive GDP growth. The highest was 5.6% in December of 2017. Ever since then, we have been on a slippery slope. This last financial year, 0.8. NDP 2030 says we ought to be growing at a high level, mid, low, at a high level at 5.6% so that we can absorb the 180,000 young graduates that get onto the job market, often with inappropriate skills. Technically bankrupt, he put us on a positive and upwards trajectory. Tabombeki continued on that. So if you just do an extrapolation, not just an extrapolation, where would we be? Unemployment will be at 16%, not 276 on a narrow definition. Expanded definition is north of 36%. GDP would be 6%, not 0.8. Last 10 years, on average, 3.5. Would have banked a trillion South African rents. Imagine what we could have done with a trillion South African rents into our national fiscals. That, to me, is the opportunity cost. So when you see the immediate past regime in the embodiment of Jacob Gelehlegi Sazuma <laughs> in one of the four commissions of inquiry that are running concurrently, concurrent and then in parallel. And he says, Angas. <laughs> know that it is part of that plan. This, is, this wasn't just corruption. Corruption is opportunistic. This was state capture at its very best. Mm -hmm. Both systemic and systematic, where every single solitary one of the institutions were repurposed. Mm -hmm. This was a political project. This wasn't Kenya, it's our time to eat too. It was worse, much worse. Because it was deliberate. When you have enlightened people who know they might ask you difficult questions and you see it reflected in our educational outcomes. We spend 10 times more on education and yet our literacy, numeracy is worse than just in the Saku region. Worse. We're 30% now, it's supposed to be an acceptable pass mark. The last fair study says 80% of grade four learners cannot read with comprehension. We are the only country in Africa, 1.3 billion people, the same population as India, 54 countries that speak 2,000 languages, 30.3 million square kilometers of coastline, where every single solitary one of the minerals that the world needs here, it's number one or number two, in abundance. And yet of 1.4 billion people who have got no access to any form of energy whatsoever. 642 million a year. No wonder we are called the dark continent. 57, Ghana becomes free. Kwame Nkuruma, 10 years later, boasts of an 80% literacy rate. Even Gabriel Robert Mugabe, the breadbasket of the continent at that time. In spite of the 1,001 challenges that is confronted with today boasts of a 94% literacy rate. Only one that did not purposefully improve the quality of education. Seen with the lens of state capture, I think it was deliberate. It wasn't an accident. Let's not be fooled. In the interest of time, let me just rattle off six big burning platform issues that business can take a leadership on, to lead on, not to follow on, because business has regained its voice. This, six, this organization that was founded in 1960, even before I was born, with only two purposes, one to defend apartheid, 
The second one for sanction pasting. It was called the South African Foundation, SAF. And we went in there because Mandela said it's okay to go to every corner of our economy and reclaim it back for ourselves. So first, and I will not unpack it, only in the interest of time. I think business needs to lead on land reform, not just expropriation without compensation. Because in land reform, there are three issues. It's land restitution, land redistribution, and land development. 25 years, we haven't even completed a land audit. 400 MPs of Holisa and Nelson Mandela, the one with the smallest budget was the Department of Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries. 25 years into democracy, still does not have a permanent <coughs> land judge. Permanent. So how could you have delivered on it? Section 25, Article 3 of the Constitution, very clear. Eighth line says, when conditions of fair and equitable have been adequately fulfilled, compensation can be down to zero. You don't need to amend the constitution. It's all there. You just had to do the doing, the execution. That's where we came short. Secondly, I think business needs to lead on transformation. This economy must look like us. When I turned 40, I'd been to 100 countries. I became an MD of the world's biggest and oldest elevator company in 1996. He remembers. Triple two Marshall Street. Two years into democracy. Not OT South Africa. OT Africa. 33 of the then 53, now 54 African countries. First three years I reported to Paris, the last two to Madrid. So when I go to India, it's clear that Indian people run the economy. Go to China, the Chinese run the economy. Japan, the Japanese run the economy. If you go to the boardrooms of South Africa today, you think that you are in Europe. Thirdly, I think it must be business that leads to get us out of this fiscal crisis. Fourthly, business must lead in helping us grow this economy. Because if the economy is not growing, very soon we'll be talking about the redistribution of poverty, mm -hmm. not the redistribution of wealth. But human psychology teaches us that when there's plenty, people are much more willing to share. Look at Christmas. I grew up in the township. All you had to do was to say, happy. And you get given cakes and hammer. Every household, it doesn't matter how poor or indigent it is. So in the midst of plenty, people are much more likely to share. Scarcity of resources, they are likely to. So let's create an environment where it's easier to share. Because the goodwill of South Africans generally is truly extraordinary. Truly extraordinary. If we tapped on just a tenth of it, we'll be the greatest nation on earth. Business must lead on helping us to keep the few jobs that we've got so that we can create jobs in large scales. So when you look at the Arab Spring, the conditions that were present are probably double here. Why Alexander is not burst into flames, I can only put it to the patience of our people. Lastly, Business needs to lead on growing our own team. The skills, the resources that we need, we must lead. When I was MD of Otis, we had a four-year apprenticeship. I got there. There wasn't even this thing called a black lift mechanic. It took four years to make one. So we used to take them. They didn't even need standard eight, standard ten. Standard eight was enough. And we made them EPIs. We would train them on the job. On fourth year, they wrote a government ticket. We kept, paid them a stipend of three and a half thousand. On the Wednesday when they got the government ticket, on Friday, they got a salary of 10,000. They were called blue-collar workers. They occupied Leon Dale and 
Don Park, where Chris Hani was assassinated. That's what, that's how economies are built, by creating goods and services that the world needs so that you can name your price. Germany could teach us a thing or two. Because in Germany, you don't even need to finish metric or grade 12, as you call it. They catch you early and they teach you how to fix cars. That's all it is. And they fix cars. The best cars in the world happen to be German because of that simple model. I went to the launch of 760 Li Maki. And the chairman of the board put it on display and says, this is the finest Maki we've ever made. And it, it was. With a key, this thing, you could tell it, it comes out of a parking and it comes to you with a key. The 760 still do that today. In fact, the whole 760 does that. And he remarked and said, but the people who built this car are not us, the executives. It's the workers. I said, where's this man going to? And says, yet, if we trust them to build our finest cars, why don't we trust them with the probity and stewardship of this company. The duty of care, skill, diligence, but most importantly, the duty of faith. So business must lead on taking this notion of education seriously because education matters. Not because it helps one to transcend social classes. No. Only because, you know, when one steadily bends the midnight oil, one gains access to the domain of knowledge and wisdom, the world of meaning, the world that cannot be conquered without a persistent crusade. Educated people that have gone to school, you can't lie to them and throw terms like white monopoly capital and radical economic transformation, and they believe you. right now I'm not going to repeat it uh, no standing ovation I guess we're not going to repeat it uh, <laughs> um, so right now we're going to just focus no more left to say <laughs> So right now we're going to, I'm going to focus on the essential part of, uh, of this uh, part of the uh, audit. Uh, let me, however, just start with something off the top. There was a question raised in the last session uh, about uh, how to actually make change. And I thought Timba answered that very well, and I tried to answer too by saying, keep beating your head against the wall. Probably not the world's most satisfactory answer, uh, but there is something, that, uh, but I do want to say something about the Free Market Foundation and what it's, it's doing. By continually putting the facts out where everybody can understand them, and hopefully the government will understand them eventually, or understand them and act on them. Uh, it's performing a tremendous service for the people of South Africa. As I mentioned before, change doesn't come quickly, but it may come suddenly. And by creating this background of information and knowledge, you're laying uh, the foundation, the environment, that will make change possible. The Free Market Foundation is also providing the platform. When Ronald Reagan uh, came into power in the United States, uh, he had a platform already prepared with the empirical evidence uh, ready. Same with uh, Margaret Thatcher. Now in Canada, um, the uh, free market reforms were carried out, um, Leon, put your hands over your ears, were carried out by uh, a left-wing prime minister of a left-wing government, and he would have thought of himself as that, 
Uh, but he carried out uh, more radical free market reforms in a shorter period of time than either Thatcher or Reagan did. And that was in large part, and this actually goes to Leon's point about people seeing the truth and people not being labeled, he saw from Fraser Institute research what the effects of more free market policies could be. Fraser Market Research and others, I shouldn't give us the, the, the total credit, uh, and took policies directly from Fraser uh, Institute research. So the Free Market Foundation is performing a vital function, not just in educating the political leaders, which is important, not just in educating the populace, which is important for the stability of foundations, but giving the government, ultimately through exercises like this, a platform that means they can come in and start to work immediately rather than spinning their wheels by trying to figure out what is going on. So it is impossible for me to say enough good things uh, about Timba, uh, Jason, Mr. Davies, uh, and uh, Leon. Uh, I've not mastered Mr. Davies' first name yet, so uh, uh, I'm continuing to work on it. Now, let me, t so let me turn to the discussion at hand, and that is free trade. The poorest nations in the world, the developing nations in the world, should be the most ardent possible free traders. Their own marketplace uh, is limited, 55 million people in South Africa, many of them poor. <coughs> you need the world as your marketplace, and to enrich the people of South Africa, you need to be selling to prosperous nations who can afford to buy things which generate the wages that cause people to move up in the income trade, in the income, uh, in their income level. Few things are more important than opening South Africa to the world. And while I said few things are more important and some things are more important, like the rule of law, Almost nothing is easier to do. Uh, establishing a culture of the rule of law is extraordinarily difficult. Now, we'll talk about that tomorrow, and South Africa already has a head start. But creating the room for free trade can be done through legislative and bureaucratic changes quite simply. Now, this is a horrible, horrible statistic. It shows that South Africa, out of 162 nations in the world, comes in 105th in free trade. Uh, South Africa will never be able to build up prosperity, full prosperity, without opening to the world. And there is a considerable amount of research that shows that nations that open themselves to the world are the nations that build prosperity and build it quickly. I'm no fan of the Chinese model, but opening itself to the world was one of the key reasons uh, why it moved quickly. South Korea, Singapore, the Nordic states, uh, Taiwan, uh, Chile, Botswana, all have opened themselves to the world, and this has proved a huge generator of prosperity. This should be an easy lesson to tell the government and to tell the average citizen of South Africa. Not only will it provide them jobs, but it will also mean what they need to buy is less expensive. It will benefit the consumer and the producer both. And one of the key problems here, and this isn't quite shown in our stats, but Africa and the <coughs> Arab world have the least intra-regional trade uh, on the planet. At, it's at shockingly low levels in both uh, places. And this is truly stifling. 
if South Africa has to sell to advanced economies, because the only way you can sell to Zimbabwe, I don't know the trade routes and details, so if I get something wrong, please forgive me. Uh, but if South Africa sells to Zimbabwe by sending a ship to Europe and then shipping stuff back, and if it's not true of Zimbabwe, it's certainly true of a lot of places, uh, you're losing a whole market which is open. If South Africans can sell to other African nations, that is a path too to prosperity. Uh, so this score here is horrendous. Now, this is South Africa uh, over freedom to trade now and over time. What you see is as uh, apartheid fell, thank goodness, uh, South Africa opened up. The sad thing is that South Africa has not continued to take advantage of the opening up, but instead its progress stalled and in fact became uh, very uh, uh, jerky. This is where South Africa stands in comparison uh, to other selected nations. Botswana way ahead. Rwanda ahead, but not as much as it should be. But this is shocking. The average world openness to free trade is greater than South Africa's openness. That's standing things on their heads. It's the poor developing countries that most need the world as their marketplace. You are ahead of the sub-Sahara African average and probably not a surprise to anybody ahead of uh, Zimbabwe. So let's take a look at some of the uh, variables. These are the variables that I uh, chose out of uh, about 10. And these are the ones where you have the worst problems. Now remember, this is out of 10. And also, because of the way this is gathered mathematically, in fact, the bottom is probably round about here. Uh, I won't explain in the mathematics, but uh, by compiling data together, you tend to normalize it in a way that it moves, that uh, zero is not the bottom, but two is. So you are really in horrible shape here. Deviation of tariff rates. That means you're try. That means tariff rates vary between types of commodities. That means you're trying to uh, benefit one industry over another, and that is the best way to stifle economic growth, because the government cannot predict where the real opportunities are. I, I like to tell the story. Uh, about uh, uh, Seattle and Oregon. If you had been a government planner in Seattle at the turn of the 20th century, you'd have said, ah, the industry we need to support is the timber industry, because look at all the resources we have. So the timber industry is what we're going to give advantage to. And when a fellow named Mr. Boeing came by and said, you know, I'd like to start an airplane plant here, they said, no, no, <laughs> that doesn't fit with Seattle's economy at all. Instead, Seattle became the world hub for airline manufacturers because the government wasn't trying to pick favorites. So airline manufacturers could come into Seattle and make it the world's greatest center for airline manufacturing. As I say, a planner would have said, oh, that's silly. We're timber. We need to give advantages to timber. Then uh, they looked at this, and some of the people in uh, Seattle and uh, Oregon were saying, uh, look, we need to get in laws that favor airline manufacturing uh, to all other industries. And when a guy named Bill Gates came by and said, you know, I'd like to establish a software firm here, they would have said, oh, that's silly. <laughs> we have world expertise in airline manufacturing. Why do we want a software uh, company here? Instead, that didn't happen. 
and Microsoft grew in Seattle. So don't believe in government planning. They almost always get it raw. And the deviation in tariff rates is one sign that government is trying to favor one industry uh, over another. Non-tariff barriers. These make no sense at all. It's not officially charged tariffs, but what it means is you know, dealing with bureaucracy, getting permissions, all sorts of unnecessary costs that benefit no one. Now, I'm not a supporter of tariffs, but tariffs at least give the government some revenue. These give the government no revenue and steal revenue from the government by limiting trade. So dealing with and reducing non-tariff barriers is essential and an immensely low score. Compliance cost. Everything I just said about non-tariff barriers also applies to compliance costs. It means that companies are spending a huge amount of money just to get their goods in or out of South Africa. And this is also a huge cost for government because if companies have to do a whole bunch to create, to meet the conditions for compliance costs, it means the governments are spending a whole bunch to monitor uh, compliance. So the government loses on both ends, and the people of South Africa are the big losers. Foreign uh, ownership, investment restrictions, capital controls, uh, these are subjects that I'm not well informed on in relation to South Africa, and they're complicated subjects, and I'll be interested to hear what folks in the room say. But it is foreign investment that really helps drive growth. It is foreign investment that brings new technology to a place, and that means that the workers are trained in new methods, their skills increase. It means that new technology hubs uh, may build. By the way, government efforts to recreate Silicon Valley are a disaster almost everywhere. But you create, uh, you bring in high technology companies or high technology investment and organically expertise uh, and innovation grows. So this is a horrible record uh, for South uh, Africa, a completely unnecessary record, one that could be changed almost overnight with the appropriate legislative and bureaucratic uh, changes. And I'm going to be absolutely fascinated by what you say about correcting this situation, which is a huge restraint on growth for South Africa. Thank you for your patience in listening to me twice in one day.